couple of quick notes. It's cold in here. Note number one. Number two, I have done this long enough to understand when you are at the end of the program, understand your time. So we won't keep you here too very long. Let me say thank you, uh, Dr. Padilla, for the invitation. Thank you all. Congratulations on the honor. Um, I have been doing this for some time now, and I have been humbled by years and years of invitations to gatherings like this. And I want to tell you that I'm not here to deliver a speech because I think it would be foolish for someone like myself to try to deliver a speech about a man who was one of the great speech givers uh, of the 20th century. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of Dr. King, his legacy, and where we sit today. You know, we continue to salute his contributions and to celebrate his life, and we should. What an extraordinary man he was. You know, that entire generation was extraordinary. I think about the idea when they said they'd rather die on their feet than live on their knees. That's an extraordinary thing to think about. To think about that there was actually a time in the not too distant past that we had to really think about whether or not we were willing to stand up and put our lives on the line to do just the everyday things, the normal things, the natural things. What I'm uh, most pleased with today, quite frankly, is the audience makeup that I see. Often when I do these, the room is about 90% black. It's almost like preaching to the choir because unfortunately in America, oft times when we talk about Dr. King or what is called black history, people assume that that's only for black folks. But that isn't the case. And so I appreciate all of our white brothers and sisters and other ethnic makeups that are here today because really Dr. King spoke to what the ideal of America is the idea of this melting pot that we haven't found yet. You see, a melting pot is not really what America is, because if you think about a melting pot, that blends everything together. I contend that Dr. King wanted us to see our differences and appreciate them and understand that that's what makes this country great. But we shouldn't castigate those who are different than we are. So while I say that, I say that there are so many others who are deserving of credit, who made the idea and the trek to try to bring reality of equality to this nation, but Dr. King is the most recognized. But I will say this, I would be disingenuous if I didn't say that the tenets of what Dr. King pushed today are not in the fore of this nation right now. We are in an ugly and a tenuous time. We are in a time of division that in my lifetime I can't remember. That isn't to say that it's the worst time, but as a child I don't remember the riots of 1968 in a way that I should. I remember being picked up from school early. My father came to get me. I remember the tanks going down the street but I didn't know what was going on. I didn't remember the killing of Dr. King as an eight-year-old. What I do remember is my mother crying uncontrollably that day and my father trying to explain to me why she was crying uncontrollably. And I knew who Dr. King was, but I didn't understand what he was fighting for at that time. I understood that African Americans in this country weren't equal, but that didn't resonate to me yet in the way I understood some time ago. And for those of you who are students here, the idea of Dr. King is really something that you fully can't understand or touch. And I understand that. It was so long ago, you know, I try to remind myself that I was born in 1960, so by the time I was 20, it was 1980. 
When someone said to me something happened in 1940, I thought, oh, what do I care about that? That was so long ago. So I understand the disconnect that some of you may have, but as you grow older, you start to understand the importance of history and those who've come before. I would imagine meeting Dr. King, who was killed when, as I said, I was seven and a few months away from the old age of eight when he was killed. And I think about the questions that must have been to meet this man. I can only liken to when I met Nelson Mandela. There are some extraordinary people in this world. I think Dr. King was that as I could feel the way Nelson Mandela was. But let us understand that in order for us to understand Dr. King, we have to believe that we should salute him more than just once a year. Take a look at your timeline today. You'll see pictures of him and quotes of him. And then take a look at your timeline tomorrow and next week and the week after that. And ask yourself, do we really live in a nation that believes in what Dr. King talked about? Or is it just what you do today to get likes on your page? We have to understand how important it is for this nation, particularly today, in a tenuous time, to grapple with what Dr. King said and to decide whether or not we really want that. I would respectfully suggest this. Today's theme, reclaiming a dream, I don't agree with. You see, the great vision of a society that treats all as equal is still a dream. We never lost that dream. So there's no need to reclaim it. If you go to the dictionary, it says reclaim, retrieve or recover something previously lost, given or paid, obtained, the return of. But we never lost that dream. We still thrived to make it real. I would say that we need to replace that word with another R word. And that R word would be realize. It is time for this nation to realize that dream. You see, if we don't realize that dream, all of this will be for naught. Dr. King suggested that the dream would come true, that he wanted to be able to see his children reach equality. So think about this. We need Dr. King's dream to become a reality, but as we see, that will take more work, especially when there are those who are working to see America stay asleep in hopes that what we see as this dream will stay just that. And there are those who want to take us back to the days when the dream, quite frankly, was a nightmare for many in this country. You see, if we keep it where it is, chasing the dream, if that remains the focus, that allows for the promise of betterment to be enough. It allows prejudice to continue to wear the mask that we have tried to get rid of. It does not allow for convalescence. Let me show you what I mean. We're in the playoff season. How many football fans here? So if you think about it, we're all geared up. Super Bowl is coming. So let's take a look at the NFL. After making Colin Kaepernick a pariah, the league was forced to deal with race. They placed Black Lives Matter logos in the end zones and slogans on the back of helmets. They donated millions of dollars, a drop in the bucket for a multi-billion dollar behemoth. But they donated millions of dollars to black causes. Oh yeah, and I forgot, the halftime show? Snoop, Dr. Dre, Mary J. Blige, Kendrick Lamar, all these wonderful black entertainers. Yet, with 32 teams, there is only one black head coach. 
in spite of a rule that was instituted 20 years ago to promote the hiring of minorities for these positions. Think about what that means. What about corporations, the companies that have given hundreds of millions of dollars to help black causes since the murder of George Floyd? that every year spend millions of dollars to air commercials right around this time, you've seen them. Dr. King's face comes up from black, a candle is lit, a choir sings behind it, and they say the dream is still alive. They celebrate Dr. King, yet the landscape of opportunities for blacks at the highest levels in these same corporations are actually declining. There are fewer black CEOs at Fortune 500 companies today than a decade ago. And what about the duplicious nature of politicians who praise King's protege, John Lewis, after his death for all that he stood for, yet they refuse to pass voting right legislations that bear his name? Legislation that would help secure what King himself fought for. Remember, the infamous Bloody Sunday March was about voting rights. Should we really still have a dream today simply to have the right to vote? Listen to these words spoken by Dr. King in 1957. And so our most urgent request to the President of the United States and every member of Congress is to give us the right to vote. That was in 1957. These words are being uttered on Capitol Hill today. Think about 1957 and police reform, 1957 and the idea of the fair housing that was not available to African Americans, women, other people of color. These fights have been going on for decades. So one has to ask oneself, are we really ready to live King's dream beyond the celebration of the day? I would sadly say, no, we are not. During these times, many raise the question, what would King do? I say that question is really no longer relevant. Dr. King has been gone now for 54 years, longer than most have been alive who sit in this room. No, there is another question that needs to be asked, and that is, what will you do? When that question is proffered, many say, whatever you need, I'm down for the cause. The response is the same as it was in the 1960s, but much like most, you're simply down with voice and not action. Most did not march with King. Most were afraid to sacrifice or simply didn't see the need to give up anything. There were exceptions. Many of you have heard of the Montgomery bus boycott that lasted more than a year. Blacks in Montgomery, Alabama, and those who supported them stayed off of city buses in that Alabama city, and by extension, the nation saw a change in the public transportation system. But that was unusual. More often than not, it was a handful of folks who fought for the many. And that remains the case today. Vice President Harris said today, we must not be complacent or complicit. So one has to ask yourself, what are you willing to do? We can't just stand by and watch the rollback of the civil rights gains that so many gave their lives for, and that has become cliche today. People gave your life, their lives for the right to vote. We kind of write that off. But think about the idea of actually finding something that you were willing to die for. That's what that generation did. So are you really, really ready to forego the NFL, particularly if your team makes the playoffs? Will you boycott your favorite company? If they're not doing the right thing, would you really pass on those new Jordans or end a subscription to your favorite streaming service or pass on a new Mercedes Benz if you can in fact afford one? Would you really sacrifice those things? 
How involved would you really, really be willing to be? Would you be willing to run for office? What demands are you putting on elected officials? Would you run for office in lieu of a C-suite job? Would you give up money that you could make in the private corporation in order to make your city, your state, your country better? These are questions that we have to start asking ourselves. And there is one very important question that most of us don't like to ask ourselves. How willing are you to really look in the mirror and ask yourself who you are? How many of you are here because you have to be? How many of you are here because someone suggested, let's go? How many of you are here with the idea that I want to learn more about Dr. King and what he stood for? And it's okay, particularly at a very young age, to say, I'm just here because I have to be. I'm just here because I get class credit. I'm just here because I had nothing else to do. I'm just here because my friends are here. That's okay, I understand it. I was there, even though I'm almost completely gray now, I'm not so old that I don't remember those days. I get it. But as you grow, one will hope your wisdom will grow. And the wisdom to be the best our nation can be can only be real if all of us have opportunity and chance. Think about all that your life would not be if women didn't have the opportunity to be equal. Think about what you would not be if people of color didn't have an opportunity to be equal. And I'm talking about from the enjoyment side of sports and entertainment to inventions that many of you may not know a person of color or a woman invented. There are so many things that we don't think about that we have to start. We have to find new narratives. The old narratives have gotten us to this point. The question is, how much further can we go? Even Dr. King's son, Martin III, called for people to refrain from celebrating this year until legislation for voting rights has passed. We can't show up just for photo opportunities when the need for black faces is there. There has to be something behind it. I got on a number of my colleagues when they found their way to the White House, and that's a heady invitation. No one wants to turn down an invite to the White House. But President Biden invited them to stand with him when he thought Build Back Better was going to become law. And yet, he had not pushed the voting rights legislation as he promised. Promised a group that ushered him into office because had it not been for African American voters, we would have seen Trump point two. I'll let you sit with that a moment. On the gridiron in corporate suites in the voting booth, we must know our worth and demand that we be given the respect and opportunities we deserve. We are in a tenuous time. In some cases, we are facing a regression of the gains that Dr. King and others fought for. We owe them more than just dreaming. We owe them action. We owe them getting up and doing. We owe them more than just this day. We owe them more than just being able to say, oh, Dr. King, that's the guy that dreamed. If you only know his I Have a Dream speech, do yourself a favor. Find more of his writings and his speeches. He was an extraordinary thinker. He wasn't a dreamer. He was a doer, a thinker. Do yourself that favor. Many of the tried and true tactics that generations have used are still vital. Marching and boycotts, they're useful today. And yet some of those tactics have lost their effectiveness. The goal now is to determine what should be continued and what should be retired. No matter, 
additional narratives, new ways are needed to find our way to reality. Our nation, and yes, even our community in many cases, became too complacent. We became too enamored with the gains made in America. America moved the racial needle toward the middle fairly quickly. The mistake was to believe that everyone moved with it and that there was no chance that needle would move backwards. We've allowed gains to be mistaken for completion. Along the way, many in black America fell asleep and began dreaming once again. We as a nation cannot afford to continue to dream. Dreaming allows you to see the world as you want it, not as it is. You don't have to agree politically with one side or another, but to try to whitewash what happened January 6th of 2021 is foolish. That was real. I don't care what side of the political fence you sit, whether you want a tax cut or not. What this nation cannot allow is for us to suggest that that was not a violent insurrection. It was. It was not simply people coming to voice disapproval. That was an attempted overthrow of an election. Is that what we want to believe America is becoming? I am not one of those who has believed in the Hollywood version of America. America is not perfect. She never has been. But what I do know is without truth, America will be as ugly as any other nation that we rail against for being wrong. We have to be strong enough to stand up and say, this is reality. So what Donald Trump and the MAGA followers have done for us all is startled this nation awake, rudely awakened by some. But we now have seen that the dream was not as closely realized as many believed, and that rapid racism and rampant racism is not a thing of the past. So now that we are awake, dealing with the reality of the need of police reform, protection of the Voting Rights Act, we see the continued racism and prejudice faced by people of color and women. Let me quote another orator who guided us by words for decades. His was usually set to music. For you R&B fans, you know the great philosopher Charlie Wilson. For you youngsters who love R&B, you know him as Uncle Charlie. But before he was anyone's uncle, he was a member of the Gap Band. And they had a hit in 1980 called Nothing Comes to Sleepers But a Dream. And it's so apropos. Here are some of the lyrics. With the sunshine comes the dawning of a day Still another dream has come and slipped away. Scattered visions of the things you want to be make you open up your mind and try to see how to make dreams come true. Oh, life is but a dream. Nothing comes to sleepers but a dream. And that is simply a way of saying that you cannot just sit. You must wake up and act and react and be willing to do what is needed. We like to talk about being woke in today's society. So let's get to that. You need to decide what you can do to make things better. Register voters, demand action from leaders, involve, your state, involve yourself in state and local elections, decide your role in this reality because we all must be involved. That's the new narrative. The march to reality needs people from all corners. 
We need you to do more than just post on Instagram and figure, ah, I checked my box. It's not enough. We all can contribute. I know not everyone is an activist, but everyone has something to give. I say this, if you have time, give of your time. If you have money, give some cash. If you're wise, lend your wisdom. If you only have complaints, then be kind and give us the courtesy of being quiet while you get out of the way. <laughs> and please remember this. I'll be honest with you. I've been doing this for so long. I used to call it, and some of you won't know who this, I, I used to call it the Phil Donahue syndrome. <laughs> then it moved to the Oprah Winfrey syndrome. And I don't know who the hell to call it now because it's so crazy on daytime TV now. But <laughs> often we get caught up in moments and we come here and we applaud politely when a line is said that either is an applause line or you really agree with and you say, <laughs> and then you leave. And the thing you applauded for is no longer important. And so I say to you, those of you who are of color or of the female persuasion, we all must understand reality right now. And that we are on the precipice of change and it isn't necessarily positive change. For white brothers and sisters who feel like that's not touching me right now, and I get it, sometimes we need something to touch us, to move us. I suggest this to you. Take a look at some of the things that are touching you now that are negative and see if they touch the black community first. See if they touch women first. See if they start to creep your way. Because the truth of the matter is when it gets ugly, eventually it gets ugly for all. I think about Columbine High School. Again, you may have read about this if you're young enough. But that's when ugly school violence, which has become commonplace today, reached the suburbs. But decades before that, it was in the inner city and it was a black problem. And then it became a white problem because suburban kids started shooting one another. Ugliness will find you. Understand it's better to catch it early. So I say this in closing. Remember, there's no need to reclaim the dream it never left. Let's vow to do all we can to realize the dream. And in that quest, let us no longer ask, what will King do? His dues were paid a long time ago. In his honor, let's begin today getting to that new question, what will I do? And then answer it not just in word, but in action. So I would ask you to please ask yourself, what was Dr. King to this nation? What did he give to this country and to me? For those of you who, again, only know him by virtue of the commercials and the one time we celebrate him, do yourself a favor. Delve into his life. See what he was asking this nation to become. And try to find something that resonates with you. Try to see, as he did, if you can become bigger than yourself. Bigger than the singular problem. Bigger than the nation. Dr. King touched the world. There is someone in this audience, and I'm not being trite, who has the ability to touch more than themselves or their inner circle. But sometimes that's lost because we don't believe we have it. So I hope that this day proves more than just a nod to Dr. King and a salute. I hope it is a way for you to find your own dream and then bring it to reality. Thank you very much.